Well, I'm going to preface my remarks this morning to say that when I'm talking about different people, I'm talking about some people, not all people. You know, there are some people who say that the reason so many people are attracted to fundamentalist churches is because when they go there, they're given in black and white form the rules they need to exactly f uh, uh, follow in order to get into heaven. And I suppose that's true to an extent. But in the last couple of weeks, I've heard the same, same group of people claim that our denomination, the United Church of Christ, is, isn't really Christian, but Christianity light. They, what they mean by that is they call us that because we don't reject people, and sometimes they do. We accept people where they are on their life journey, and sometimes they don't. A lot of the times they don't. We accept people as what we say are siblings in Christ and find room at the table and the church for people who are gay, female, another race other than their own, who are physically or mentally challenged, are refugees, or who may believe something entirely different from us. Amen, that's right. And we do that. Sometimes they don't. I'm pretty sure it's mostly the same group of people who have systematically been splitting the country apart as we've been watching these last few months. They think we don't have any rules, any laws, and they've got them all. The real truth of our particular church is that here in this one congregation, which has always fascinated me, we have such a divergence of beliefs, especially politically. And we have politically conservative people and liberals in here and somewhere in between. But all of us on the nature of spirituality and religion embrace what Jesus said about faith. We all belong to one another all belong to one another. And not just in this church building. These weeks ahead, months ahead, we're going to be bringing the sounds and worship of other cultural groups into this church. We're going to have Filipino dance very soon, and then we're going to have uh, a, whole day for, a whole day of Hispanic devotion, etc., right here with joyful, uh, joyful uh, rejoicing. You know, we do have rules, and they're sitting right in front of us this morning in that reading that Gary did. We also have Jesus telling Peter this morning that in order to bring God's kingdom to earth, suffering and sacrifice are necessary. You know, sticking to the rules isn't the easiest thing to accomplish. All of us know that. Now, Gary just read Romans 12, and I suggest you go back and read it again if you ever get exasperated during the week, because it'll give you the rules that Jesus wanted us to follow. Uh, you know, we, we, we hear that living up to some standards is a challenge, and then there's Paul. Paul wrote this letter to the Romans for a reason. He wrote to a group of beleaguered people in Rome in the year 67, and they were just trying to hold on to the things that they'd heard Jesus say, the beautiful terms, the, the blessings. And they were trying to do this at a time of a world of political mayhem, where enemies were executed in the Colosseum by throwing people to the animals. And, or, or your enemies were scattered across the countryside as roadside crucifixions. That's what the Romans were facing. The only thing that counted in Roman culture, unfortunately, was to be tough. Tougher and better armed than the next guy. Sounds a bit familiar, doesn't it? So Paul fashioned out of Jesus' precise words and actions this set of rules 
for the Jesus followers, Christians, us. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering and persevere in prayer. Bless those who persecute you. Bless those who persecute you. Extend hospitality to strangers. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. It's a hard one for some people. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. Never avenge yourself. But remember, vengeance belongs to God. And if possible, live peacefully, peacefully with all. You know, there's no doubt about it. Our human nature makes these rules a challenge. While Jesus said his yoke is light, pulling that load of, of rules is a workup. These days, if we indeed live like this and think like this in this political environment, chances are some people will accuse us of being woke. I've always wondered what woke was, you know? So, if you've wondered what woke was, this is what the dictionary description of, is of wokeism. Wokeism is a term used to describe a social and political movement that seeks to address and correct social injustices, inequality, and discrimination. It emphasizes recognizing and challenging systemic issues like racism, sexism, and other forms of oppression. Sounds awfully good to me. Dear God, please let me be woke today. You know, a, a, a few years back, I was talking to a barista friend of mine at uh, a Starbucks, I can't even remember which one it was, when a police officer came in, and when she prepared the cup for his coffee, she took the paper cup, and along with his name, sh she wrote on the back, without thinking, be safe and God bless. He was really moved by that simple act of kindness, be safe and God bless. We belong to one another, all of us, even in pain, especially when thinking outside your own grief, when it might seem impossible to think outside of your own grief. You may remember a few, back, a few years back, who could forget it, when a madman attacked a simple Amish school for girls. That was in 2006 in uh, West Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania. And when he, who was a non-Amish local resident, barged into that little school armed with a 9 millimeter handgun, this was before AK-47s, he rolled down the window shades and tied up 10 of the girls. They were aged 6 to 13. When a student escaped, and got help, the police arrived, and he shot all 10 girls. Five died. He intended much worse for those girls, but then he shot himself. Now, we would call out this this day, and we hear it too often, a massacre. But the Amish always released themselves from anger and evil, and they refused to call it that. And they, said, they started calling it at that time, the happening. And they still call it that, the happening. And on that very same day, when their children had been slain, the parents of those girls brought food to the mother of the man who had killed their children. Why? They were realizing that she, too, must be in shock and grieving. The very next day, the Amish community leveled that school building so that it could not stand as a, as a temple to evil. Ironically, there was quite a bit of criticism about the kindness of these Amish families. Some, some people across the country said uh, that, that the re revenge is what should have taken place. Uh, my colleague, Reverend Peter Marty, 
So some critics of Paul say that he is too soft on justice. But as part, Peter Marty says, actually Paul is full of justice. All he is doing is placing the burden of who is allowed to carry out the revenge exclusively in the hands of God. The problem is with these vocal critics, the ones primarily that are on the conservative area of the, of the uh, spectrum, is what's happened. At one time, the conservative uh, end of the spectrum is these people would have been the ones tying their beliefs and actions to, to those of Jesus Christ. That's what, that was what they were. But these days, as people immerse themselves in the culture wars, the same people are now adopting the views, it seems, of another Messiah who demands their loyalty. This past week, Russell Moore, the editor of, in chief of Christianity Today, and himself a conservative, stated on NPR that as a result of the shift in the way that people perceive and relate to their Christianity, Christianity's in crisis. He blamed it squarely on the tribalism invading conservative circles. He, he said that multiple pastors had told him that after they preached sermons on Christian values like turning the other cheek, parishioners, parishioners would complain that, quote, these were liberal talking points. When the pastor would point out that he was literally quoting Jesus Christ, the parishioner would uh, reply, that doesn't work anymore. That's weak. Now, Jesus is too woke for some conservative evangelicals. Online commentator S.C. E. Coppin in her opinion piece yesterday said, it's not surprising as the culture wars are now the total focus of this end of the politics, compassion and empathy have become dirty words. Compassion is now synonymous with wokeism. Empathy and the social safety nets have become synonymous with socialism. Now here's the thing. The rules of compassion, hope, and caring are the only ones that matter to those who really follow Jesus, the only ones that matter. And here's another clue. Anyone who tells you the, these rules are too weak is no longer following Jesus. And you should worry who the, it is they are following. So when I started looking up examples of people who had kept Jesus' rules, I suddenly realized I didn't have to look very far for those people. When you place that cooler of water out front, you were woke. And then even more people joined in, you, in your wokeness with water and ice. They joined in with your Christianity and your love. Every week when you work in the thrift shop, what you do makes the gifts of other people available to those facing need. You are woke. You're spreading love. Whenever you take the time to put something in the collection plate to, or make a pledge to the church, you ensure that we're here to give out that food card to the hungry family that comes to our door on a regular basis or to provide free pastoral care. You too are woke. You see, we are all one in the eyes of God, and that is the biggest rule of all. Amen.